Hi everybody, my name is Katie Fagan and I'd like to welcome you to the New England Aquarium and the Simons IMAX Theater. This is the 11th um, lecture of our fall series um, and on behalf of the trustees and overseers I'd like to welcome you all. Um, tonight I have the honor of introducing Dr. Michael Telesti. He's the newly appointed Director of Sustainable Science. Uh, Dr. Telesti has called the aquarium home for the last 14 years and is, in his current role he works to lessen the impacts of aquaculture and fisheries. Uh, to where they can fully function as part of a healthy aquatic ecosystem. In his spare time, Dr. Telesti also uh, does research on the American lobster shell disease, analyzing global trade in aquatic wildlife, and evaluating the aquaculture industry as it moves towards more certification programs. Please help me welcome Dr. Telesti. Good evening and thank you. Um, Okay, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so, welcome, welcome to the aquarium. Um, we're really excited to have our guest, Woodbury's here. Um, they're talking about something near and dear to everybody's heart here in Massachusetts, and that's clams and oysters and shellfish. And here at the New England Aquarium, um, we do a lot of work in seafood, and we're really interested in seafood because as a protein, seafood is so important. Um, when animals live in water, they actually don't have to spend time holding themselves upright, so they're actually more energy efficient. And a lot of the seafood we eat is actually, they're cold-blooded animals, and so they don't have to pay um, a metabolic cost. So they're actually really efficient, and um, if we're going to feed the world, seafood is going to be an important piece of actually feeding the world. Um, the interesting thing about clams and oysters is that if you look at the total amount of seafood we're eating as a nation, it's going down per person. We eat about 14 pounds per year. And the sad thing is, is that the shellfish has been in 10th place for the last decade. So we're actually not doing a better job eating more shellfish. But hopefully through the woodberries, they actually um, will make that happen eventually. So, um, so it, it gives me a great pleasure to bring the woodberries here to you tonight. Uh, they are a dynamic husband and wife team from Wellfleet, Massachusetts. Um, they're both marine uh, biologists, and as we'll hear tonight, they're clam and growers and oyster restorers. Is that, <laughs> is that how you say it? Um, 27 years ago, they, they opened uh, their shellfish farms after finishing graduate student, after finishing their graduate studies at the University of Chicago in zoology. I'm also from Chicago, so um, you know there there is something to be said about Midwesterners coming out to the East Coast to work on seafood. Um, so, you know, shellfish farming is really great because it is a business, but yet there is actually a lot of um, benefits we can derive from the ecosystem, and so really it is it is the forefront of the blue revolution. And so they're combining sustainable fishing and the fresh and local seafood movement. And they have, um, they've actually received um, much critical acclaim for their work, including a nomination in the 2010 um, Chef's Collaborative Sustainability Award. So um, I think uh, they're gonna tell a great story tonight. So um, why don't you help me welcome Patrick and Barbara Woodbury. Great, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much to the NEA staff for inviting us, um, and thanks for coming out. Uh, I'd like to tell you our story, and as Michael said, it started 27 years ago when we were in grad school um, studying uh, biomechanics of marine invertebrates, which was a fairly dense and uh, not very practical field. Uh, but we knew folks that were just starting out in the aquaculture business in Wellfleet. And Wellfleet, because of its history, uh, has been sort of at the forefront of shellfish aquaculture for actually hundreds of years. So 27 years ago, we packed up, moved east, and began uh, farming clams and oysters. And what we do is we, we cultivate harvest, and then uh, distribute them in the Boston and New York areas. And then as a second part of our business, we've always been uh, trying to develop techniques and tools to use in the aquaculture business to make it more efficient 
and then also look at bigger issues, apply aquaculture kind of techniques and thinking to them. And uh, uh, these are issues like uh, restoration, habitat restoration, um, using shellfish. So let's go jump right in. Now Wellfleet is uh, on the Cape. It's a, a town where, uh, as I said, historically, um, it's got a, a real connection <coughs> to the sea. And New Englanders are connected to the sea in, a, I think, a really special way. Whenever we talk to people about our story, um, usually we get lots of comments from folks who have had some sort of connection with either fishing or with um, you know the marine environment and it's meant a great deal to them and they share their stories of going out cohogging with their family when they were uh, young using their feet to puddle up uh, shellfish uh, gathering them um, or just s sort of scenes out in the uh, marine environment where there'll be one one fellow was telling us just just last week how he had a, a moment when he was out uh, fishing for oysters in, in Wellfleet. It was a cold, crisp morning and there was no wind. And across the bay, there were some brant geese just sort of dabbling around. And all of a sudden, they all took off. And he could hear clear across the bay the sound of their wings through the air. And that's the kind of connection, I think, um, that we're fortunate enough to to have sort of established between ourselves, the place where we do our, our growing, um, and you know the uh, creature themselves, the, the clams and oysters. So our town, historically, there's um, in in a number of different areas. There's our ancient <coughs> midden mounds that that uh, suggest that Native Americans used clams and oysters as a, as, as a very essential part of their diet. These, sh you know, are old shell piles and they're quite dense and large. Um, in the last 200 years, there's been a, uh, a, a, a huge kind of um, shellfish uh, aquaculture. It's, you know, it, the proto-aquaculture um, where people have been tending oysters and uh, the Wellfleet oyster became renowned uh, during that period. Those are old postcards from the uh, 1900s. In fact, you can look out on, on that top card in the very back, there's a spit of land, and that's exactly where we, we grow our shellfish. And here's the, the railroad bed that took, took uh, oysters away from Wellfleet uh, and distributed them all over the country. Um, so our town is steeped in it. And then we find also that things that we observe in the habitat where we do our growing uh, <coughs> occur in, more, uh, in a more global context. And I, I want to uh, get to that later. But first, here's Wellfleet Bay. It's protected by Great Island on the uh, uh, left-hand side of the slide here. It's a protected area. It has a 10-foot tidal exchange, so it's uh, bathed, nourished twice a day from that, uh, that tide. And it is a perfect area for growing shellfish. Clams and oysters were, uh, have, have grown here. Um, Champlain landed off of the end of Great Island and called it Billingsgate because it resembled the great seafood market in London. Um, we have fresh water coming in on the north, east and northwest, and the combination of the fresh water and the tidal exchange creates the milieu for the food organisms that feed the shellfish, the, the phytoplankton. And let's zoom in even more, this is on a Google map, of our actual growing area. These are called the, the growing areas that where people conduct aquaculture in our town are known as grants. They're an area where we have the exclusive uh, right to grow and cultivate. Uh, we lease it from the town, and the state also regulates the uh, grant system. But it's an area where we can 
um, put shellfish seed out, grow it, harvest it, and tend it. So it's, it's really more like a farm uh, than anything else. And it, even in this, uh, this satellite photograph, you can see in the center of those dark bands, those are nets that cover the rows of clams that we grow. And then off in the upper right corner, you can see some little objects. And the, what those are, those are oyster racks on a uh, oyster growing area. So we have the, the big tidal exchange of 10 feet. We have um, the perfect kind of, kind of growing conditions. And so this is the, the uh, setting for the period of time we've spent in the last 27 years growing shellfish. So we're, we're lunar. Um, this is a picture of our Google Calendar. And if you look, uh, the little blue tabs are the time of the uh, low tide. And you'll see that there's two low tides each day. We have a semi-diurnal diurnal tide system. So two low tides, two high tides every day. We have to work around low tide. So this is a, a week in the life. Um, and you'll see that our schedule shifts by an hour since the tide shifts by an hour each day. So our, our schedule is lunar and we are, you know, we, we bay at the moon essentially uh, because we've been doing this for so long. So we work tide to tide, low to high, and then season to season. So now Barbara's going to talk about aquaculture and the, uh, the actual species that we, we deal with. Hello. Um, so here we are harvesting clams. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the players. Um, just to clarify, these are the, the two species that are pretty much grown aquaculturally in Wellfleet. Um, they're hard clams and oysters. Hard, and this is just a summary of the differences between the two. <coughs> hard clams have a foot. They dig with their foot into the sediment. So they, don't, so they don't stay on the surface. They dig down. They have siphon, which they use to feed and spawn and um, breathe. Um, whereas oysters, on, and alternatively, live on the surface. They're epibenthic. Um, when we grow hard clams, we usually get the seed from a hatchery. And I'll go into that a little bit more. And when we grow oysters, we can get the seed either from a hatchery or we can actually um, get seed in the wild. And I'll show you some of the pictures. Um, hard clam size at harvest has to be one inch across the breadth. We're, and an oyster has to be three inches long in this state for us to harvest. Anything smaller than that has to go back and grow. Um, and for a, one organism, a hard clam, Mercenaria mercenaria, has an awful lot of names, and you probably hear them around here. They are called little necks, count necks, middle necks, top necks, cherry stones, quahogs, chowders. Reflect the different size, but it's all the same species, if you were ever wondering. Um, but there's only really one name for an oyster, the Wellfleet oyster. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about growing oysters, just summarize. Um, this is uh, showing the difference between nat naturally growing oysters and hatchery, and doing it in the hatchery. For, um, Growing them in nature, adult oysters, the sexes are separate. They're, um, they spawn, broadcast spawn. So they c each organism can produce millions of eggs and sperm. It's light, temperature, tidal, tides, and sun trigger spawning. They, um, sperm and egg come together in the water. And there are several larval stages for that last about a week or so. Um, and then the oysters settle down. They're at a pet of villager stage. They have a little foot. That's the only time they have a foot. They settle down, and that little dot on that shell would be called spat. It's early spat. And then those little oysters set, or spat, settle on shell. And that's the thing about oysters. They're very particular about where they settle. 
They're choosy settlers they, because they're looking for a place where the adults live. And so they won't just settle on any surface, but they won't, and they won't just settle on the sand. In a hatchery, this is sort of replicated, broadcast spawning. They're fed with a larval culture um, and then grown in an upweller because they're feeding on the naturally occurring plankton in the water. That's how these guys grow. There are no feeds or fertilizers. They're just naturally occurring plankton. Um, and then cultivated either off bottom or on bottom. Um, another word I want to acquaint you with is something called culch. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Culch is shell. Uh, material that's put out at a specific time to catch oyster seed or spat. It's a way for the, it's a place for oysters to settle. Oysters need a hard surface and the culch is what people use to, to catch them. This is a picture of Edwin putting together oyster hats. These are used in aquaculture. They're stacked hats. They're, you can see in the back, a full stack. They're rolled in a very thin concrete mix and put out in, on the on the shellfish flats, and then the little oyster larvae, when they come time to settle, are attracted to the lime, um, and they you can get a lot of little oyster, oyster, oyster spat. Um, this is a picture of wild oyster spat, um, just on a large scallop shell, and you can see, as well, oyster predator. These are oyster drills, and what they do is you see those little circle in the middle, they drill a hole and they will completely eat the baby oysters. So um, this is a picture of hatchery going oyster spat. It's different. It's um, there and, and for aquaculture, there's a great interest in growing oysters that are select, individual, not not in a reformation, because everybody wants the chefs and the restaurants want uh, um, oysters that are individuals and will sit on a plate. So it's a whole different type of um, interest in growing oysters for food and growing oysters for, re for restoration. And there's an importance to both. Um, this is a slide of a, of a farm near us. These are um, growing partners, and they grow oysters. So once the little seed, the little spat, get a certain size, they're put in bags according, with the mesh according to the size of the oyster, and then grown. Um, this is low tide, water comes in, they feed on the naturally occurring phytoplankton and, and they get bigger until the wonderful day when they're three inches long and we can harvest them. Um, and this slide, I don't know why she's in a Santa Claus suit, but it um, shows just the fact that oysters have been enjoyed for centuries all around the world. Um, now for a little bit about hard clam aquaculture. Here's my shucking technique. Um, it all begins with it growing clams. It all begins with the seed. And this is a small bucket, because you can tell by the size of my glove. Um, and in that bucket, there are 50,000 um, clams. Um, and the mark on the cup is 3,333. So um, we get these from a hatchery in the spring. Um, usually early June or end of May, um, and put them in nursery trays. Each nursery tray is an extruded mesh lined with um, mosquito screen and filled with sand. Um, and we sprinkle these, there are 333 and a third clams in that cage. Um, and, and so the whole idea is predator exclusion and a controlled environment as much as we can. Uh, when I showed you those old other pictures of spawning. One individual can spawn a million clams, I mean a million eggs and sperm. So the whole, and why aren't there, why aren't we inundated with clams in our harbors? Because not, they don't all live. They're, they're eaten, they die from whatever source in nature that kills them. So what we're trying to do in aquaculture is kind of get rid of the things that kill them. <laughs> and in this case, a big one is predators. We have Crabs, birds, ducks, um, snails, a lot of things want to eat them, when, especially when they're little. And we um, get whatever help we can get. <laughs> um, once they're in the nursery trays, it's about growing. And most of the growth occurs in the summer. They're cold-blooded organisms. 
as you heard, and um, plankton is also most predominant in the summer months. So we protect them and they grow. In the fall, it's our big plant out. Um, and what we do is go on the moon tides. That's the biggest tidal exchange. So we get the most time when the water's low. And we turn the cages upside down and shake out the sand. And then open the cages and then we remove any predators that have settled in, like mostly crabs. Um, and here's a picture of the seed clams at the end of the, in the fall. And they're about thumbnail size and they're very beautiful. Um, we, we plant them in rows on the ground at low tide. Um, here we are sprinkling them out. And then each of the rows, is about, they're about 12 feet wide by 50 or 100 feet long. And we dig trenches on each side and, and we rake each row clean of every predator we can find, moon snails, crabs, it's pretty labor intensive because it ha has to happen during the low tidal cycle because if you rake it and then the water comes back, well, predators can come back in too. So we sprinkle the clams, cover them with mesh, and dig in the mesh to keep them from coming in on the sides. And then it's, a, it's, wait, it's waiting for them to grow. Um, and usually for clams, as I said, it's two to four years and this is our grant one winter, and anything can happen in two to four years. <laughs> so it's, um, there's ice, there's weather, there's fouling, there's predation, possible disease. So, you know, it's farming. <laughs> um, this is a picture of uh, harvesting. Um, I want to remember that original little bucket of clams? That was for 50,000 clams. Um, that would grow in two years, two or three years, to two tons of little neck clams, um, just feeding on phytoplankton. And we harvest using a bull rig. It's <coughs> pretty as primitive as you can get. It, um, so we stand next to each other in um, high water and hold the rake, and it's sort of a motion like this, pull back, fill up your rake. Um, and this is a 10 of a day, I would say, but sometimes it isn't a 10, <laughs> especially this time of year where the wind can be so extreme, you can hardly keep a, a basket, you know, a, a crate up. Um, once we harvest it, we bring the um, shellfish back to our sh shellfish shop, which is also where we live. But, um, and here is our sorting machine. Um, so this machine grades clams. The rollers turn like that, the clams come down. And as, they, as the rollers get closer towards us, they're further apart. So the clams fall down according to size into different bins. And so we can sort according to size. We can um, take the shellfish that are um, under one inch in breadth back to the shellfish grant. Um, and then it's counting, marketing, delivery. Um, and so the clams get ready to um, be distributed. And then it's food, glorious food. <laughs> and um, this just shows some of the wonderful things that some of the chefs in Boston do with the uh, shellfish. So once the, oops, going backwards. <coughs> Barbara was saying we, we distribute in, in the Boston and New York areas and one of the things that we were very fortunate uh, to do is, is build our business um, at a time when people were super dedicated to getting uh, fresh and local ingredients that even 25 plus years ago when we started hoofing around Boston to show people what we were growing, we got a really enthusiastic response. and. Uh, chefs back then were already sort of taking the California food movement and, and bringing it to Boston where uh, there was a, do a dedication and commitment to trying to source ingredients locally, trying to find stuff that was uh, um, grown by, uh, you know, or trying to get their ingredients directly from growers. And so we, we've been 
very, very lucky to be connected with the whole uh, Boston food scene. And these are, this is what happens when chefs come out to visit us. We put them to work, <laughs> but they're happy to do it. And um, beyond that, aside from wanting to know, they want to work because they want to see what it's like and what they want to know uh, everything they can about the food that they then create their, their amazing food, you know, their amazing creations with. They want to they wanna see exactly where it comes from. And I think that, that connection has really uh, been, been amazing, uh, an amazing boon for our business. And of course, they also like to, whoops, they also love to eat. This is Bill Bradley, the chef from the New England Aquarium. He's their celebrity chef, and he's no uh, stranger to loving shellfish. And other people love them as well. <laughs> he really likes shellfish. <laughs> so I'd like to talk a little bit about sustainability because it's a, it's a huge word in, in food today. And, you know, it's, it's really an important concept. I think it's gotten a little bit overused, but I think there's a lot of nuances to the idea of sustainability that are important. And I think it has a lot to do with what you're growing and where you're growing it. Um, and I know Michael uh, spends a lot of time looking at um, seafood and how it's, how it's grown and trying to assess it. So for, in, in the context of what we do, uh, I think sustainability uh, has a bunch of points. And the first point, is shellfish are, are low on the food chain. They're eating algae, they're eating food that's naturally occurring. Um, there's no feeds or anything. And I like to call them free ranging, but what's free ranging really is the, the phytoplankton because as the tides come in and out, that food is brought to them so they can grow in really high densities. Um, <coughs> because their food, there's, there's this 10 foot tidal exchange which is loaded with nutrients um, twice a day. And um, so we get in an area, say for uh, clams, we can grow 50 to the square foot. Um, and in an oyster, you can, uh, oyster growing rack for instance, you can put 200 or so adult sized oysters in a, a bag that's maybe three feet by a foot and a half. So these are really, really high densities, but the fact that there's so much uh, food abundance makes it possible. So it's a really efficient way of, of growing food. <clears throat> the habitat where they grow uh, are natural habitats. I mean, we're doing some things like putting nets to exclude predators or using the racks and bags in the case of oysters, but the habitat where they're growing is a, a natural habitat for them. They've grown um, for many millennia in uh, salt marsh and estuarine habitat, so it's, it is their natural uh, place. Harvesting we do by hand. Barbara was telling you about bull raking, the dance that we do with uh, the hand rake. Um, it's minimally invasive to the sediments. Um, distribution we do in, in our business, uh, about 95% of what we grow, we distribute within 100 miles. So we're not using lots of fossil fuels to move stuff around. Um, and renewability, the uh, seed, as Barbara was explaining, are replenished each year from a hatchery. So at any one time, if you look at those, uh, that satellite picture, you see the different nets covering different areas. Those are different year classes. So each year we put in a new year class. We har we're harvesting on three, four-year-old clams or two-year-old oysters and then uh, just replacing. And we're not impacting people doing shellfish aquaculture, aren't impacting the wild by taking from the wild. They're just working their little farms. Um, and there are ecosystem benefits to shellfish and I'm the key key idea here is the filtration um, these guys are amazing filters uh, 
a clam and an oyster can filter um, roughly, as a, conservatively, uh, a gallon per, per hour of water. And if you look at um, a, a small grower, say one or two people farming, can produce uh, 250,000 oysters and probably 500,000 clams in a year. Um, that's 750,000 organisms pumping. That's 750,000 gallons an hour. If you conservatively estimate 10 hours, that's seven and a half million gallons of water filtered. And what they're doing is they're, they're feeding, they're removing particles. They have uh, their gill, gills, which um, are um, basically their feeding apparatus, are a kind of sieve. They're sieving out particulate matter. They're taking food, but they're also taking uh, particles. They're clarifying the water. So that's a, that's a big component. Um, also, there's stuff growing on nets and growing around um, where we cultivate. And they produce areas where fish and small invertebrates and algae and other things grow as well. And lastly, there's uh, the social benefit. Um, since we've been in the business the last 25 years, we've seen well, in our town alone, there's 100 growing areas. So that's 100 uh, individuals or families that are able to uh, do aquaculture to uh, make a living. So for the first time, you're seeing uh, a lot more young people involved in the fishing industry, where with the capture fishery, that it just it dropped, it dropped off while aquaculture was starting to build the capture fishery, and people involved in it uh, uh, dropped off drastically. So there's the social benefit. Also, people who are doing aquaculture, because they're, they're wedded to their area, to their spot where they have the rights to grow, are stewards. They're stewards of the environment. And that's uh, kind of new. When you think of fishing, you don't usually, um, you think of people that are, uh, go one place or another place to get their catch. But we're, we're linked to our area. And for that reason, we're very, very concerned with water quality and environmental quality. So there are challenges on the global level that we see in our, in our small little, little place. And um, overfishing is no stranger. Wellfleet was the, the oyster population was completely decimated, um, and the town had to put in regulations prohibiting anybody from taking any oysters in 1770. So um, it's been happening for, for as long as people have been fishing. That gave rise to uh, bringing in shellfish from other places to restock the beds. And that was a kind of aquaculture, kind of tending. And that was kind of the beginning of the boom years. Um, but overfishing is, has always been part of the problem. Um, habitat destruction, global warming, all of these have an effect on um, what we do and water quality, of course. In this picture, um, we're picking up large uh, sea lettuce, which is a macroalgae that blooms in the summer. And we get huge mats of it. And if we don't sort of pick it up, we pick it up and bring it, bring it, bring it home and compost it. But it covers the beds, and it smothers the shellfish. So this is um, with nutrification in the, in the harbor, with you know, too many nutrients, you get more of these large macroalgal uh, uh, kind of blooms, and it's, it becomes uh, a s significant problem. But we, we've also, beyond looking at sustainable food production, which is really what we do, uh, we, we've started or 
well, we've always been involved in design and in research, but we've gotten involved also in oyster restoration. And um, if you're a grower, or if you've been a grower uh, in the aquaculture business, there's no such, in, in most cases, there's no such thing as off the rack gear. You basically either have to make it or, or build it, uh, design it yourself, um, or find, you know, people who have uh, expertise in a very, very, very specific, like we have a, we have a bull rank maker who has been in the business for, for, well, as long as we have. And they're the best, we go to them and we say we want a three and a half inch tooth, 20, 20 teeth, stainless steel basket. I want a Harley handle. That's one with the, with the handle going down like this. It's more comfortable for bull ranking. Um, so we have, you know, there, we have artisans that are uh, dedicated to our industry, but that's, you know, that's special. In most cases, you have to figure it out yourself. So one of the things we did uh, early on was develop this uh, cage, and it's uh, the nursery tray that Barbara was telling you about. We needed something that was uh, light enough to be handled by a single person so you could shake it out and deal with it yourself. The old, old school was two by fours and hardware cloth, and it was just monstrous to, to try to shake out at the end of the season. So we developed these. This past year, you saw the big sorting machine in our shop. We had a welder put that together. But we wanted to take that technology out to the field. And so we, we got a grant from the Southeast uh, East Massachusetts Aquaculture Center to make this field sorter. And uh, what it allows us to do is separate out the sublegal clams from uh, the legal stuff so that we can immediately replant the, the little stuff into two separate rows, the, basically the runts, and then the ones that with a few more, maybe another month's growth, will be ready for market from the legal stuff. And that's the stuff we'll bring back for, for selling and distributing. Um, it's run on a um, car seat motor that we got uh, off the internet and a, a battery from um, uh, a power tool. So we were able to finagle uh, this machine and it's been fabulous. We're able to blow through lots of uh, product and get, uh, get it separated. We don't end up bringing back a lot of the small stuff and I think it's better all around for the survival. There's been a, a pretty large push in the last uh, 10 years anyway uh, to look at oysters as a tool for restoring habitats. The global picture for oyster reef destruction is very, very bleak. There's been, uh, you know, 85% of reefs have been impacted or completely destroyed. So um, these things have a huge ecosystem benefit. They are, you know, an oyster bar is a structure and they have all these organisms associated with them that help um, water quality, maintain uh, nurseries for, for small creatures. So they're extremely important in the um, marsh habitat. Uh, so there's been a lot of different efforts for oyster restoration. The picture on the right is an area in Wellfleet where there's an active restoration project um, which is being conducted by UMass Boston and um, several local groups in town. And what they're doing is they're trying to take an area that uh, was pretty much mud flats and um, restore uh, an oyster, oyster reef. And the techniques they use uh, are to put out culch. And, and um, Barbara explained culch, it's shell material. You need a substrate for oysters. If, there's, if there are oysters that naturally settle in the environment, you need a substrate for them. And so what they do is they put uh, 
tons and tons and tons of cults. The, they come by truckloads, spread them with barges in an area, and you can see if you, if you go and zoom into Wellfleet, you'll see on Google Maps, you'll see those areas where the cult has been distributed, the little squirrel, squiggly circles. The idea is that if you get that shell out in July when the oyster larvae are in the water, they'll settle onto the shell and form little proto, little proto reefs. And that, on the left side, is a picture of um, a uh, sea clam shell that's got about a dozen oysters on it. And you can see already it's a tiny little community. It's got the oysters, it's got snails, it's got a, an alga growing on it. So even at that sort of proto stage, this thing is, uh, uh, has, has the potential. There's also a predator. You can see wedged right in the, the middle there, there's an oyster drill. So um, this culture is a, is, a, is, a, is a great resource for trying to reestablish um, an oyster bed. Um, there is a problem with cults, though. And as we said, it has to be out at exactly the right time. If you put it out too early, it gets covered with sort of uh, green uh, sort of film. And then it won't be attractive to oysters. They really uh, prefer something that's dry or sort of um, clean. Maybe they really prefer clean shell. If you put it out too late, you've missed the set. The oysters have already settled. Those that don't find something to settle on perish. So um, it's a very tricky thing, the distributing of cults. So what we, we decided to do was study cults and try to put together um, some of the aquaculture techniques we use for rearing oysters with cults to try to enhance the cult, figure out whether we can um, sort of bump up the amount of settlement you get on it. So what we did was we <coughs> took cult to the hatchery in Dennis. It's called uh, Aquacultural Research Corporation. And that's a huge oyster vat. It's a, uh, a settling tank where they've, they've spawned oysters and then they put them in this huge tank where uh, the larvae are floating around, and we put these bags of shell, these bags of cultch, in those settling tanks. They get peppered with oyster set. You can't really see them when you first get, get it from the hatchery. They spend about um, a week in those tanks. But we took those and we put them out in several different treatments. We put them in bags on racks, um, the, with the remote set, and then we took just plain cult that hadn't been to the hatchery, uh, bags on racks, and then we took plain cult like they do in the restoration projects and put it on those plots on the ground that, that Barbara was uh, standing next to to compare. What we found was that, um, first of all, the set this past summer was pretty dismal, the natural set. But what we found was if you have just the shell on the ground, it, it got almost no set. Shell that was up on a bag on the racks using the aquaculture techniques caught sort of a moderate natural set. But the remote set, that's the stuff we had in the hatchery, was, you know, as you might expect, uh, did really, really, really well. So the remote aspect allows us to um, in situations where you don't have a good set, you end up with shell like the one on the upper left. That's one little piece of shell and it's completely in, in, engulfed in oyster set. So the idea is that if we uh, can get people doing aquaculture to uh, use this cult technique with remote set. They can enhance the cult and then connect with people doing restoration and uh, use that cult in the restoration process. 
So this is our crew. And each year when we get started, we look at what we have to do. And uh, we see that uh, we've got hundreds of, of nursery trays to put out filled with each with six shovelfuls of sand and 3,333 clams. <laughs> and we have to bull rake thousands of bushels of clams. And it's a bit daunting, but what we say to each other is, let's be ants. Let's take one sand of grand, grain of sand and move it from here to there. And uh, that's the way you do it. You keep your head down and do one thing after the, the other. And I think that's really the way it's got to be with the restoration process, one clam at a time, one gallon filtered at a time. And I think it's a, a very, uh, got a lot of potential and it's going to be a very encouraging future if we can, we can do it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have uh, some time for questions. So, yes. So the, the, the question is, uh, where, where does the seed come from? Is it from Wellfleet or is it from somewhere else? Well, the seed, we, we get a, um, all of our seed from a place in Dennis. And what they do is they spawn uh, broodstock. And what they try to do is take broodstock from fast growing uh, uh, stock in the field in Wellfleet and spawn it. Um, this is for both both clams and oysters so um i mean they have other they have sort of pro a proprietary uh system so we don't we don't know everything about the genetics of what they do but that's that's i think their their general technique okay other questions yeah so oh, okay. um, i'm sorry The question is, how's the control, the, the difference quality. in environment between a controlled versus wild and aquifer, the, quality, the, of the quality of the environment? It's the same because it is a wild environment. It's just aquaculturally grown in a wild environment. Um, it's not like a, in a laboratory, and it's not like um, it's not like a salmon farm in the sense because we're not caging them in and, and feeding them or fertilizing them. They're just feeding on what a clam would feed on if they were out in the wild. Yep. You have something else? Additionally, um, as far as flavor and that, that kind of thing, um, I think, like Barbara was saying, they're really in the same environment. They're feeding on the same foods. Um, there are differences in the, the wild fishery in, in Wellfleet, which is fairly limited for um, oysters. There are a few areas open uh, for wild pickers, we call them. Um, the thing is, with aquaculture, you have total control. You can harvest uh, a large amount when you want, and you can uh, have a very, very consistent product. So where you get a lots of variation, a lot of times the uh, places where the wild pickers go are, are reefs. And you saw how the oysters grew on those shells. Mm -hmm. They grow long and narrow. And what they're trying to do is reach up into the the, the water column because where there's flow there's food um, so you get a, what we call a banana is an oyster that grow or a reef oyster and so the guys that are picking in the wild tend to get more sort of variation in shape um, whereas the stuff that's cultivated from hatchery seed where everything's a perfect single from the from the get-go they tend to be rounder and more visually, you know, that's the kind of visual appeal. So there's that consistency. Also harvesting, you can harvest in the morning, you can get 2,000 or something. Whereas if, if I had to get 2,000 oysters from a digger, they have a one bushel limit. That's about, you'd have to get 10 diggers to get an order of that size. So, 
you know, there's practicality to the aquaculture. <laughs> Well, I know that in, in, in our town, there's... Can we repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Boston Harbor. Soft-shell clams seem to be completely uh, gone. You know, I, I, I really can't answer that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm... So, and you know, the the concern being raised is that you know currently there's no clams in Boston Harbor. Um, you know, the harbor's undergone a number of changes, and not all of it is natural. You know, we we used to dump a lot of our municipal waste in the Boston Harbor, and then we went in and we cleaned it up. Um, you know, a lot of my work is on lobster, and we we've, we've seen great shifts in lobster in Boston Harbor as we've changed the nutrient loading. To the bay, um, so there there are just many many changes going on. Some of it's natural, some of it's global, some of it's local changes. Um, you know, there was um, the Massachusetts Oyster Project was looking at getting shellfish in, and oysters in particular in into the harbor, and um, the Division of Marine Fisheries is just really really not excited about having another fish species in Boston Harbor um, and that's that's what a lot of that comes down to so there's not only the, all of the biology going on but there's the regulatory regime and then you know so there's this is just something where it, it's it's impacted on on so many levels and you know it is difficult to kind of you know if there are no soft shelled clams there there likely could be many reasons why you know Many causes for for why that fishery is is going to work. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, there's there's a group up at Salem State College, Joe Butner and Mark Frigo, and they they do have a clam hatchery up there. So I'm I'm surprised that if there's a disease that they wouldn't be working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. But, but like I Those said, uh, trying to get a, an active harvest out of Boston Harbor is, is difficult from the regulatory standpoint of it. Okay. Any other questions? It was a, it was a major contamination of the soft shell beds near the airport in which the EPA hit them with a very, very heavy fine. I think it was Swiss Air gasoline. Oh. Uh, from the fuel, supposedly damaged some major uh, uh, soft shell beds. So uh, that's just part of it. But I have a question. Yeah. I just did you did you hit her? Yeah. Um, the the comment was that um, a lot of the soft shell beds are around Logan Airport, and there is fuel dumping going on. You know, if you have to turn a flight around, you have to dump some fuel. And so I guess Swiss Air. It wasn't was just. It, it was when they fuel the plane. Apparently. Yep. Oh, they were spilling. They were spilling fuel during the fueling, and then, right. and then, the runoff from, yeah, from uh, the, from the tarmac. So there, there was fuel contamination, which, you know, when you start stressing out animals for some reason, they're much more likely to pick up parasites and and other pathogens. So and and so it sounds like there was some sort of fine levied against Swisser. So the large, so Massachusetts Bay, so look the larger, but okay, okay. Yeah. I, I heard seen in, in about September a report that there was a vibrio, vibrio contamination of oysters, and I don't know if that 
happened in Welty? And what so is the result the, of all the that? The question is about a Vibrio contamination of oysters. There was a Vibrio. Vibrio is, for those of you who don't know, the question is about a Vibrio contamination in oysters. Vibrio is a bacteria. It's um, not harmful to the oyster, but it is very harmful to people who eat the oysters raw. Um, it, uh, there was a, um, several cases of people who got Vibrio uh, poisoning and it was sourced back to um, Plymouth, Duxbury, that area, and then also to the vineyard. Um, and so the state, which uh, Division of Marine Fisheries, which regulates all of the shellfish harvesting, closed those areas down. And they were closed for quite a long time, I think. They just reopened about three weeks ago. Um, they also uh, enhanced the kind of uh, measures uh, to protect the public against that kind of bacterial uh, contamination by requiring um, growers to be very, very uh, careful about icing because it's um, icing their product. It's important that you chill things. It, it's, this, this bacteria is uh, grows in a heat-dependent way, so stuff that's warm or left out can get uh, contaminated. So there are new regulations that the DMF gave uh, sent down for uh, harvesters and for wholesale dealers to, to try to deal with that issue. Was but, that from storage? That, um, that bacteria is naturally occurring in marine environments. Um, it's a function of how much is in the oyster. So if, if there's a temperature abuse, if it gets too hot for too long, you get a kind of a spike in the number of bacteria in the oyster and that's when it gets toxic. It's naturally occurring in most marine environments. It's not an, it, it, in fact, it hasn't been a problem here until the last three years when, and it, I think it has something to do with climate change. Maybe it's important that we only eat shellfish with months with ours. <laughs> <laughs> but yet you weren't you weren't affected. We, we weren't, weren't. We weren't no. affected. Uh -huh. and, but also it's it uh, it's also it has to be it has to start from the harvest all the way through till it's served. Consumed. Yeah. So it's about handling it even in kitchens and, and so education has to happen from the grower all the way to the table. And actually, he just mentioned the months and the dark. Can you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you go ahead. Yeah. Um, that's a um, common uh, adage that uh, oysters are best in the cold months. Um, they're not spawning in uh, you, oysters, as we were telling you, spawn in June um, through the summer, and then there's sometimes a little spike in September, um, I eat oysters all year round. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a difference in the quality. When they're spawning, they tend to either be really, really rich before they spawned or fairly thin and watery after they spawned. This time of year, they're done spawning. They're building up glycogen stores, so they tend to be, they get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter as the cold months progress, then they're dormant. And during that dormancy, they kind of buffer their, their metabolism by uh, taking in calcium from the inside of their shell. So that flavor, there's a winter flavor also. Um, but the answer to your question is, eat oysters all the time. <laughs> <laughs> It's, culture is an interesting thing, and I think it's, it's as a restoration tool, it's going to be um, more and more difficult to obtain. Um, we used uh, uh, ocean quahog shell, the um, mahogany is another name for it, uh, that we got from a, from a um, 
I don't know what you call it. It was like for, used for driveways, basically. Um, but the town gets um, sea clam shells from plants that shuck uh, sea clams in New Bedford. Um, but I don't think, like, I, I got an email from a town, uh, from Terrytown on the Hudson. They were doing a restoration project. And a guy said, can you get me 20,000 yards of oyster shell? And that's, I, that's probably more oysters than Boston consumes in a year. Um, so that's one town and wanted that quantity. So if this kind of use of um, shell continues, <laughs> the, the resource will be completely depleted. I just, um, want say one thing yeah. I just wanted to say one thing about the culture. One of the big, the problems with the putting down of the shell is that it sinks into a muddy sediment. So it's not even exposed to to the oyster larvae. So it just sort of sinks down and, and it's functionally not as successful as putting, as you know, raising it up. So that was one of the main reasons we, we wanted to raise it up. Yeah. Um, the questions about oyster gardening in Boston Harbor and, and what we think about it. Um, I think it, it's a great idea. I know there will be problems with regulation, regulators, and I know that public health officials are concerned about having oysters in a harbor if they can't harvest them because of water quality issues. They don't want people getting sick. And, and I think we saw a, a, something about a restoration project in New Jersey, and they were very, very successful, but they shut them down because People, they were afraid that even though the area was closed, that somebody would come and harvest them. So that's like a touchy, it's a touchy and controversial subject. And if I guess if there's good enough education, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Also, down, down south, there's been a lot of work on restoration uh, in the Chesapeake and then in uh, South Carolina. Um, and they do a lot of outreach to communities and, and they have programs where um, people who live by the water, who have docks or something, can can get uh, oyster uh, posts set or uh, remote set like we have, and grow them out. I mean, these are these are awesome because they get the community involved, and people really are interested and really want to get sort of their hands wet doing this kind of stuff. Uh, so I think that's great. It's the reason we were looking at it from an aquaculture standpoint is people in the aquaculture business are in the business of doing these things in a large scale. So, so that's, that's our angle, is, is see how you, you bring the restoration and aquaculture people together. Um, but I think it's great, uh, a community builder and, and, and awareness builder to do it uh, on a small scale of, with, uh, you know, sort of individuals. There is a oyster gardening program at Roger Williams University. They do have a hatchery there, so um, they do some of that. And you know, when we when we talk about one of the ecosystem benefits of oyster, in the Chesapeake Bay, oysters used to to filter the volume of the Chesapeake Bay every three days. That was a long time ago, and then because of overharvesting, they were estimating that oysters were only filtering the volume of the water every year, once a year. So you went from filtering the water once every three days to once every year. So, you know, that's kind of the power of, of what Oyster has. And um, so again, it's, it's great if we can do anything to get, to get this natural, you know, service back in, but people have to be smart about it, so. Okay, we have another question? So the, the question is, how is everybody working together? Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> basically, how do we all work together? Um, you know, there's just so many inroads, you know. Um, a program like tonight, you know, bringing the message of what shellfish can actually do um, both culinarily and, you know, from an ecosystem service, um, you know, getting people involved, getting people aware. Um, you know, there are, in the science community, there are limited research dollars that can be spent on this, and so, again, we, we need to, to work together more um, cooperatively than, than, you know, in, in opposition. Um, and then there's, you know, we've already identified one research problem of, you know, what's going to happen to cults? We need, we're going to need more. Can we come up with some sort of artificial means to get oysters to naturally settle? Um, you know, how, how can we manage some of these wild resources that we've already, you know, played, played around with significantly? So I don't know if you guys have more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, what, um, one of the other areas that we're, we're very interested in is proto-reef formation and looking at structures, trying um, small, small structures to start scale, like small reefs, oysters to settle on small reefs. So we're work, that's, this, we've been working at designing and material science, so it's like an alternative to um, shell material, culch material. I mean, there are many different oyster settlings um, programs and methods. There are gigantic reef balls that are put out to start oyster reefs. There are um, all kinds of, there are these things like giant jacks. They look like the child's toy jacks. And there are all kinds of different um, um, cement structures, metal structures to start oyster reefs. In the south, it's a different story because they don't have the ice issue that we have up here. Um, but we've been, one of the areas that we want to work on is small proto-reef um, design. No further. Okay, I've I've been informed that we're um, we've we've pushed the time limit enough. Um, <laughs> I think uh, why don't we give our speakers um, another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.